Today, we're going to dabble in what I like to call introductory advanced C++, by which I mean the simplest parts of modern C++ that you absolutely need to know if you're going to be working in the language. All right here today in Dave's Garage. Hey, I'm Dave. Welcome to my shop. Today, we're going to look at some of the most fundamental aspects of modern C++. I think there are really two pieces you need to know in order to produce modern, safe, and effective code. Those pieces are the vector and the unique pointer. Why those two? Well, it seems there's been a bit of a rush to learn Rust of late, as though it were the only solution for the problem of a bad C++ code. You see, most people, and I was no exception when I got started, write bad C++ code. That's because they generally ignore what looks like a really complicated standard library. Most new C++ programmers wind up writing what I like to call C with classes. They break their code up into compartmentalized classes, and perhaps they use inheritance and polymorphism, but that's only one aspect of C++. What winds up happening then is that they bring all of their bad C habits with them and they just wrap them into classes. If you are still calling malloc or new or using simple pointers, then you're one of the folks I'm talking about, and I'll show you everything you need to know to stop doing it today. You see, Rust protects you from yourself in most cases by simply prohibiting you from doing stupid things like having dangling pointers or using memory after it's been freed, common off by one errors, and so on. But you don't need to run out and learn a new language just to solve these issues because the modern C++ standard library provides you everything you need to write code that has essentially the same protections, but still in C++. And so there are a few things we won't be doing today. We'll never allocate and free our own memory, as that's the source of numerous defects in code. And it makes your code patently unsafe. So how do you write safe code in C++, and how do the allocations actually happen? Well, it's all based around the notion of two pointer types provided by the standard library, the unique pointer and the shared pointer. And because most non-trivial code needs to at least make use of arrays, we'll introduce the vector class as well. Now, I blame the naming of C++'s array class as the vector for turning off more new C++ programmers than any other factor. If I told you that C++ has awesome dynamic arrays that grow and shrink on demand and handle everything magically, and that it was called the array class, you'd likely be down with that. But as soon as you dip into a source or header file and see a bunch of vectors, maybe you start thinking matrix math and linear algebra, and like a lot of people, you run in the other direction. So let's get it out in the open. The array class in C++ is called vector, and it's really just a dynamic array. I suppose they could have called it the n-tuple to make it even worse, but either way, correct or not, vector is just an array. So when you see vector, think array. Using modern C++ features like vector and unique pointer can help create more correct code and reduce memory problems as they provide better memory management, increased safety, and improved performance. These features simplify resource management and make the code more readable, robust, and maintainable. The next complication that throws people for a loop, pardon the pun, is the use of namespaces. C++ packages its standard library up into a namespace called, predictably, STD for standard. And that means your code becomes full of standard colon colon vector and standard colon colon string, and it can get a little unwieldy and verbose. That's why today we're going to do something that I don't actually encourage you to do in the long run, which is to add using namespace std at the top of your source file just after the main includes. Doing so will allow you to just say vector or string or unique pointer without the std prefix, and the code becomes a lot simpler to read. So for today, we're going to run the risk of namespace collisions and ambiguity in favor of simpler code. We're going to say explicitly at the top of our file that we're working in the std namespace, which allows us to refer to anything in the standard library without worrying about it being in a different namespace, because our code will live in the very same namespace. Let's take a brief look at each component, and then we'll dive into the editor, and we'll explore them in a few examples. Vector. Vector is a dynamic array provided by the C++ standard library. It manages memory internally, allowing growing and shrinking as needed whenever you add or remove elements. This alleviates the need for manual memory allocation and deallocation, reducing the risk of memory leaks and other related issues. Using a vector has several advantages. Automatic memory management. It handles all memory allocation and deallocation, preventing memory leaks and ensuring that the allocated memory is released when the vector goes out of scope. You never allocate or free objects directly. You let the vector do it for you. Bounce checking. The vector provides an at function that provides bounce checking, helping you to prevent buffer overflow and other out-of-bounds access errors. 
I rarely ever call it because I think actually having to call at to potentially throw an exception and find out whether your element is in the array or not, uh, it's a bit sketchy for me, so I tend not to do it. Iterator support. The vector supports iterators, which makes it easier to work with the standard library algorithms and range-based for loops. You can create a for loop that just iterates over every element in a vector without worrying about indexes and bounds. Dynamic resizing. The vector grows and shrinks as elements are added or removed without the need for manual sizing. Now, let's take a quick look at Unique Pointer. Unique Pointer is a smart pointer provided by the C++ standard library that represents unique ownership of a dynamically allocated object. It automatically deletes the object when the Unique Pointer itself goes out of scope. Using Unique Pointer has several advantages. Ownership Semantics It enforces a clear ownership policy ensuring that there is only one owner of the allocated memory at any given time. This avoids issues such as double deletion, memory leaks, and dangling pointers. Automatic Memory Management It handles memory allocation and deallocation automatically, releasing the object memory when the unique pointer goes out of scope or is explicitly reset. Custom Deleters It supports custom deleters, which allows for more fine-grained control over how the managed object is deleted. For example, in the ESP32 code I write, I have a special allocator just for external PS RAM. I don't manually allocate and free that PSRAM, I just specify that the relevant classes should use the PSRAM allocator, and the rest just happens automatically. Move Semantics It supports Move Semantics, which allows for the efficient transfer of ownership without copying the managed object. This leads to much more efficient code. Let's take a look at some code. I've written the very basic logic for a game of Blackjack. It just includes the logic for managing the deck, the cards within it, and the player's hands. We'll start in the program's main function so we can see the overall logic before we delve into how it's all implemented. I hope you'll agree that it reads quite straightforward. First, it declares a deck of cards, then it calls shuffle on that deck. Next, we declare two player objects, one for the player and one for the dealer. Then the player is dealt two cards, each of which is retrieved from the deck by calling draw card. We then repeat that process for the dealer so that both the player and the dealer each have two cards. Now, I haven't included the logic for actually playing the hands out, as I'm trying to keep it brief and clear, so we simply display the two hand values on the console to make sure that everything is working as expected with the player and the deck classes, as that's where the substance of this code lives. Let's scroll up and look at those classes now. At the top of the file, we can see the ranks, or the values, of the various cards being defined in the rank enumeration. Each card has a simple English name and will have a value equal to what you'd expect for a card with that name. Next, we define the four suits, hearts, diamonds, clubs, and spades. They're also assigned integer values, but we never know or care what they are. The card class represents a single card, whether it's still in the deck or in the hands of the player or the dealer. You create a new card by invoking its constructor, which requires that you specify the rank and the suit of the card. Internally, each card tracks its rank and suit, and that's all it knows about itself. The deck function is where we start to see some of the interesting memory management and modern C++ functionality. One unfortunate part of C++ is that it doesn't provide a way to get the lowest and highest values in an enumeration, so if you want to walk an enumeration with a for loop, it's up to you to know where to start and where to end. For cards, it's fairly simple. We start with the ace that has a nominal value of 1 and work our way up to the king, which is 13 in the index. But for the suits, we have to know that our enumeration starts with hearts and ends with spades. In any case, we're going to create each of the 52 possible cards and add them to the deck. But we're not going to create cards. We're going to create unique pointers that own cards and let the pointers worry about everything else. At the bottom of the class, we can see that the deck's vector actually holds unique pointers to card objects. Those cards can be as big and complicated as we want, but we just hold pointers to them. When the deck goes out of scope, the vector will be cleaned up automatically. And that means everything in the vector array will also be cleaned up as well. If they were regular rolled C pointers, we'd have to free the cards or some other similar nonsense, but for a unique pointer, the compiler knows authoritatively that the pointer owns the object that it points to, and so it cleans up the cards as well. Remember that the vector is fully dynamic. It starts empty and we add cards to it, and when it goes away, it cleans everything up. There's never any need to specify up front or later or at any time how many objects your vector can or will contain. You can optimize your code by doing so in some cases when you know what the sizes will be, but it's not required. 
You can just keep adding objects to a vector as often as you'd like and then remove them anytime you need and all of the memory management is handled for you. There's no chance that you'll leak memory or reference elements that are no longer in the array or any of the common C pitfalls that have made C and C++ somewhat notorious for their lack of reliability when poor memory management techniques are employed. Back up where we do push the card into the vector, you'll see that we're not creating a local stack version of the card and then copying it into the deck. Instead, we're using a function called makeUnique that constructs a card dynamically and then returns a unique pointer to that card. Any objects to the card constructor go right after the makeUnique call as normal. Now as noted, a unique pointer is unique in that it is the sole owner of whatever it points to. If a unique pointer goes out of scope or is otherwise destroyed, then the object it was tracking is automatically freed. The pointer is inextricably tied to the card, so it's almost as if the pointer is the card for our purposes. But what if you copied the pointer? Well, the thing is, you can't duplicate a unique pointer, and you can't have multiple pointer references to whatever it points to. There's one and only one unique pointer per object. All 52 cards then begin life as unique pointers to cards that are stored in the card's vector. In practice, this means that you have a deck object in your main function. The deck object owns the vector of cards, and the vector of cards owns the unique pointers. When the deck goes out of scope at the end of main, the vector is automatically cleaned up and that in turn destroys each of the unique pointers that own the cards. The unique pointers free the memory associated with the object pointed to automatically. It's all about ownership and scope, and doing it this way eliminates the numerous ways that you can corrupt or leak memory in standard C. The deck class provides only two member functions, shuffle deck and draw card. Shuffle deck needs some way of generating random sequences, and it's going to use the MT19937 engine to do it. Oddly named, but this is very much like your good old C rand function, but it's a much better pseudo random number generator. In fact, the period, or the number of cards that it can generate before a cycle repeats, is 2 raised to 19937, hence the name, which is way more than the number of electrons in the universe, so you should be good for a while. The syntax for the shuffle call, which is part of the standard library, is to give it the first and last cards in the sequence, and then a reference to your random number engine, and it does the rest for you. When the shuffle call returns, the contents of the vector will be completely randomized. It's worth noting that a unique pointer, like a regular pointer, can still be null, which just means it doesn't own anything. There's no object to free, nothing to be done when it goes out of scope. We see this in the draw card function. When there are no cards left in the deck, the deck will report that it's empty here and a null pointer will be returned. Now, this doesn't mean that you have to constantly check your unique pointers for null before you use them. It just means that when a function creates a unique pointer and fails, it can return a null. All you have to do is check for null before you add it to your array or collection in your air checking and you'll be safe. If there are still cards in the deck, we get the unique pointer out of the array by using move semantics. Move semantics warrant an entire episode on their own, but it does essentially what you think it does. Since you can't make a copy of the unique pointer even if you wanted to, this call moves ownership from one place to the other, from our deck to our local unique pointer, which we will return to the caller. The array still holds the now empty pointer, so we call pop back to remove it. Rest assured that even if we somehow forgot to call pop back, there's no room here for memory duplication or leaks, just an empty card slot in the array. You'd have a logic bug to fix, but it wouldn't corrupt, leak, or do anything bad with memory. That's way easier to debug than heap corruption. Next, we move on to the player class. Down at the bottom, we can see that the player has its own array of cards, which represent the cards held by the player. Again, this is a vector of unique pointers. We don't have copies of the cards from the deck, but rather our vector will take ownership of whatever card is passed in through add card. Note again that the card is never duplicated. It is moved directly to the end of the array using, again, move semantics. By never duplicating any cards, we avoid all the possible pitfalls of trying to do that properly, and every card that was ever in the deck is still either in the deck itself or in one of the player's hands. The getHandValue function is largely uninteresting. It just calculates the total value of the player's blackjack hand and takes into account the weird scoring of the ace, which can be both 1 and 11, depending on the other cards in your hand. It also serves to make all of the face cards worth 10, as is the rule in blackjack. Now that we've seen the deck and card classes, let's return to main to have another look at how it actually uses them. First, as we can see, our deck is shuffled. It now contains all 52 cards in random order. Two cards are moved into the player's hand, and two cards are moved into the dealer's hand. If we inspected the various vectors at this point, we'd see that the deck now contains 48 card pointers, the player's hand has two of them, and the dealer has the other two. Every card is accounted for somewhere. 
The code then prints out the value of both hands and that's it. I hope it's a little more clear now how, by using the vector and unique pointer classes, that you can create code that is effectively impervious to memory management bugs. Even logic bugs that will inevitably get introduced along the way won't cause crashes, corruption, or other common C issues. You just fix the logic and the code itself remains solid. If you've enjoyed this episode and like to focus on coding, please let me know by doing three things. First, make sure you're subscribed to the channel so I know that there's an audience for this stuff. Second, if you assume that you already were subscribed, this somehow people are getting unsubscribed periodically, so click the blue arrow in the corner there to double check. And third, do take a moment to turn on personal recommendations if you want to see the episodes from this channel so that you actually find out when I do release a new episode. Being a smaller channel, it's quite possible it just slip by without your notice. I've put the code for today's episode up on GitHub, and I'll include a link to it in the video description. In the meantime and in between time, I hope to see you next time, right here in Dave's Garage. This little chair will be waiting for one of you, and a rocking chair for another who likes to rock, and a big armchair for two more to curl up in. All next time on Dave's Garage. <laughs>